to another episode of Federico Talks Watches. As you can see, I've got Hansi back. How I, are you? Man? I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> and I really hope this works out because uh, my microphone broke on the way here and there's yeah. some scotch tape. That you did well. It's That's beautiful. Ma master watch painting. <laughs> really, I have to say you should work here. <laughs> <laughs> no, they really don't want me That to. was awesome, man. No, no, we did, a, we did an excellent job. With <laughs> well, guys, if you are new to the channel, this is Hans. He is the master watchmaker that works with me at Delray Watch Supply. That's DelrayWatch.com. And, um, you know, we're really good friends, and, you know, every so often I bring him on the show to answer some questions, some watchmaking questions that are just way above my head. That's not true at all. <laughs> Come on. And um, so it's, it's quite special to have him here with us, especially after such a long time. But before we get started, yeah, I do have to let everybody know, if you guys do need watch service, go to DelrayWatch.com, click on the service page with Hansi here. I will take care of it. It will be my pleasure. It will be his pleasure. Absolutely. For a small fee. A really small fee. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, a bunch of other cool watches that just put up a vintage Navitimer and a white Rolex Milgauss, a Panerai Tritium dial, a bunch of cool stuff and more in the description, DelrayWatch.com. Right, so... We're here today, I've got five questions from our viewers. Awesome. That need a watchmaker's expertise. Sounds good. Right? So I'm going to ask you and uh, get the best answers we can, right? Hansi, Dumb. this is one of my favorites because it drives me nuts. How accurate, okay, how accurate can you expect a vintage watch to be? Now, what is a vintage watch? Let's say 50 years plus. Right. right. Can you expect this watch of this age to be running within COSC certification even after a service? Is that possible? Well, that's a very, very interesting and tricky question actually. Mm -hmm. It uh, all depends a little bit on the overall condition of the mechanism. If for 50 years, like you have a, a vintage Mercedes Benz. Okay. You always go to the dealership and you always have a master mechanic working on that Mercedes. Okay. So after 50 years, all the parts most certainly are uh, in good shape where you can still get a high performance out of it. Mm -hmm. Which watch movements, it's almost the same thing. If you mm -hmm. had it uh, in the corner, uh, on the corner watchmaking shop and uh, over several services, uh, the pivots are all run out, worn out. Uh, the, the the maintenance was not done correctly. You cannot expect that. However, mm -hmm. for example, I'm uh, in this business now close to forty years. If you always brought that watch to me, always. So always. how about like every five ten years? Ex exactly. So okay. if it be average se every seven years to overhaul it. It would be in perfect condition if I would have done it. And then you can still do uh, dynamic poisoning on the balance wheel, but not dynamic poisoning like they do in, in Switzerland during the manufacturing process. We'll, we'll explain uh, dynamic poisoning in a second. Right. This is uh, uh, the dynamic poisoning on the watch, on the whole movement, and basically to time a watch to the uh, to the owner, basically, on the, the because of the activity. That's exactly the right. Because everybody it, wears. If different. you live in Alaska where it's ice cold, or you live in Miami where it's nice and warm all year long, you will have different uh, different outcomes of a service. In that sense, to be like five to six sec, seven seconds a day, plus or minus. What an old watch is, I highly would recommend just to not have a headache with those things is to maybe use like the Audemars Piguet standard of uh, timekeeping of brand new watches because they have a, a quite a fair uh, uh, expectations of timekeeping around 13 or 15 seconds a day. Plus I guess. minus 13. Right, so this is fair and, if, and that's brand new watches and so, so those are high-end brand new watches and if you uh, apply this to vintage watches this, this can be achieved. So huh? you think it's fair, like if I bring you a vintage Omega 1965 Seamaster, right. a good job would be 13 seconds a day. It is possible, like, uh, of course, with a caveat, where I have to say if it was maintained if properly. It was maintained, yeah. This is really the key. If uh, the pivots are all worn out and all, all the wheels have to come out and have to be replaced to polish, it's a, a huge job. Like in my shop, uh, for my bright clientele, I offer sometimes for an additional additional service charge of $150 more on top of the regular service. 
uh, where I can uh, do, because I see already the, you repolish the wheels exactly, and, and I can actually dynamically voice the watch completely correctly. And so, but there's so much labor involved, so somebody has to pay for that. But it sure. is possible. But but so but because a lot of people they do email me and they say, right. hey, Federico, I've got my 1952 right. Seamaster. Right. It's running eight seconds a day. Oh, that's this, just. It's unreasonable. It's unreasonable, and this is a lucky person who has uh, seen us. Yeah, that. that's what You're I'm... lucky at that point. You're yeah. really lucky. One can also not promise too much. You know, those things work. But uh, they do, we, we are entering a field now with dynamic poisoning a watch where, where if you, you can, you know, for, for, for my master degree in, in, in the watchmaking mm -hmm. school, we had to bring it down to two seconds. Mm -hmm. But how long does it stay? So you have a watch which, uh, on an average, in all ten positions, keeps around two to plus minus two seconds. But you you wear that watch for two years; it's off that uh, completely off those readings again. Or even because two the oil, months. That's right, possible. because the oil gets more hard. The oil is not that viscous any longer. So it, it does. It depends okay. on those things. It, it it is the the key sentence to that is it depends on the level of kaputness. The level of kaputness. Yes. Is that a technical term? <laughs> <It's> my term. <laughs> All right. So to answer the question for everybody, plus minus 13 seconds a day, Always very reasonable. Totally possible. All right. So question number two. This is a funny one. I like this uh, one. Hansi, what is the most annoying movement to service? Now, I'm sure you can do it, but what is the one movement where if I put it on your bench, you just say, shit. You know it's a great question again, but uh, I have done so many decades of watchmaking and you run across so much not that great watches. So I don't want to like single out a certain piece. You know what the difference, those, that's actually a really great question. Uh, when uh, in the 1990s, 19, in the, around the turn of the century, when uh, CAD programs, uh, computer assisted uh, CAD, design, yeah. Uh, came into the play in watchmaking, all the watches actually became very, e not very easy to service, but very logical. Okay. The, what we, uh, before that, in the 1970s, when I went to watchmaking school, for example, there was those, those weird watch designs sometimes, those movement designs, where we in watchmaking school with our teachers and our professors, we said, hmm, this watch was conceived by the ill mind. <laughs> the ill mind. <laughs> yes. By the ill minded, right. yes. So by the mentally infirm. <laughs> and when you have that, then you have a problem. So, okay, that's a great answer, but you're not getting off that easy because when Federico talks watches, <laughs> we don't hold back. So I'm going to force you off the top of your head to come up with one movement that you just. I'm not saying you can't service it, but you really don't enjoy oh, it. Oh, sure, sure. And right away, you have to jump to, to the old uh, designs, yeah. because that's where they just draw uh, and with the pencil, they draw, drew some things, and then the manufacturer, oh, it doesn't work out, but we already invested a million dollars, so let's put it on the market anyway. <laughs> right? So I, I would think the Caliber 11 from Dark Hoyer and Breitling, this was horrible. That is, that's the chronograph. That's the, that's the right. first, is that the Absurd. first automatic chronograph? <laughs> I guess it's the mod it's modular. Yes, it's, it's horrible. So that's the guys. That's the one in the Monaco, um, and I think in like the old Breitling Chronometer. That's right. Okay. The so old, so yeah. that's a this was a co co production between Tag actually and Breitling. They they, they developed that movement. It was a piece you know of you might upset a lot of people because that's one of the most collectible movements. Oh, in beautiful. The world. Send them in the service, no problem. A caliber eleven <laughs> Monaco is worth. <laughs> Five fig. I mean, it's worth a yeah, lot. Yeah. It's possible. You just call it a piece of crap. Yeah, well. <laughs> I love you. I love you. All right, Hansi, your phone with the questions. I need your finger. <laughs> not in that way. All right, here's, here's an interesting one, okay? Because this even I don't know. I mean, I think I know, but I don't have your level of expertise. Etta and Salida. Oh, okay. okay. You know Salida, they make out the Etta clones. Exactly, like Seagull does. Uh, yes, kind of. like the, yeah. Yeah, those are the Chinese ones. When I give you an ETA 2892 mm -hmm. or an ETA SW300. That's right, that's right. Do you notice a difference? Yeah, there's actually a huge difference. There they is. look the same. Okay. You, you open up the case back, you take out the movement, and to the, uh, the, the non-technical eye, it will look identical. Mm -hmm. If you do take two pictures next to each other, you put it online, People will ha have a really, really hard time to see the difference, okay? 
However, what they did, as the reader did, they figured out once the, the patent expired from ITER mm -hmm. and they were able to produce that uh, completely in the law, then they, they saved themselves some money and they, they, do, they flipped around the bridge design where usually the, the bridges are held by the main plate mm -hmm. and uh, in the ITER movement they drilled the the uh, securing pinions in the bridges themselves. So it's all... Uh, Is that a good or a bad thing? It saves them money. It saves them money. Okay. And so they did, however, change a couple of wheels too. Like the reversing wheel is different. The the barrel and some of them are different. So there's actually different parts in there too. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. because this is a statement I've made in other videos. Okay. And this okay. is my experience, but yeah. I don't know if it's true. I've noticed a higher failure rate with Salida yeah. than Edda. It's like software programming. You bring something you know, you you redesign a software package like uh, something. Uh, and you don't better test it. Then you have bugs in it, and when they designed, decided to save money and turn those things around, which for, for decades was working fine for ETA, mm -hmm. then uh, they, they opened up a can of worms where certain things uh, got uh, unfortunately messed up. So the, the, I have a huge... When I started my own watch production, I actually tried to contact Celita and uh, to, to supply me some raw movements to for, for me to prototype. They said no. They actually wanted, but they, they oh. wanted. They wanted, but I had right away such a hard time with them that I sent them to hell. <laughs> no, no, really. Okay. okay, so if you have to pick Edda or Salida, if you had to choose, which one would you choose? Edda. Okay, by a long shot or just you know a little bit. By a long shot. Okay, for, for sure. sure enough. You know, funny, that, that, that question is really cool because I also have uh, done prototyping with the seagull movement mm -hmm. and the, because they're 100% clones of either. Yeah, that's they're, the they're exactly the You can take either part of the seagull you bet, bet, they're completely going to work. It's, it's just absolutely amazing. Are you telling me you'd no. rather have a seagull than a No, salida? absolutely not okay. because it's poorly uh, machined and poorly okay. manufactured. But they actually took the 100% copy. It's replaceable. It's completely saying. replaceable. And so it's very, was very interesting, actually. This is a question that I picked because I know his opinion, but I think uh, oh. my viewers should know. Anzi, what do you think of the new trend in watchmaking of using silicon parts? Like Zenith with the silicon escapements, Breguet. Oh silicon is the future. It's anti-magnetic. It's a new material. What do you honestly think? It's a piece of crap. That's what I think. Well, Look, yeah. the thing is uh, with silicone parts, I understand they have to reinvent the wheel. I understand they have to make old things look new. I know that there's, uh, isn't it in America they say the Murphy's, Murphy's Law is why would you re change something when it's working? Well, Murphy's well, Law is it? anything that can go wrong will That go is wrong. correct, yeah. Well, don't, don't fix it while it's not broken or something like that. I guess that can be completely <laughs> translated from Austria. Whatever, <laughs> I'm telling you. The thing is, uh, my absolute favorite movement of all times, mm -hmm. El Primero. El Primero. Zenit. I love that brand. Then they started putting silicone parts in it. The escape wheel is a silicone part now. A day is the, uh, the pilot fork is a silicone part. Which is weird. Cause yeah, it's a high impact part. Exactly. And they have the, first of all, they, uh, they're running on 36,000 amplitude. Yeah. That, that, that's really like quite something. And uh, it all worked for them in the, in the Tudor, and in, in, in actually in the Daytona, it worked great, mm -hmm. right? For years, for, for decades, it worked fine. So they had to put a silicone part in it. It constantly breaks. It wears out, it breaks into pieces, the, the watches need service. I'm going to be with Zenit in a month from now in Switzerland. Oh, nice. Yes. In the factory? In the factory. And uh, they're supposed to uh, teach me, to give me a course on, on high, like on the Delphi. Uh, and guys, guys, if you don't know this, this is something I want to mention. Even if you're a master watchmaker, be it Hansi or Philippe Dufour, you constantly educate yourself further. The brands force you yes. to take refresher courses. That's right. So even though, let's say, you might be able to do the El Primero with your feet, no, not even I, your hands, you yes. have to go into yes. the course. No, I do it with, like, with one hand, with a left hand and one, two, two at the same time. <laughs> two at the same time. It's a joke. <laughs> this is absolutely, I love that movement. It's one of my favorite because it was designed before Cut designs came in, but it wasn't a real mind, and, and it was not a real mind. Okay. It was not a sick person designing that. It was really, a, it's a beautiful movement, it, it, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And when those those uh, the engagements happen in Switzerland, and they wanna teach uh, 
you know, a refresher courses and stuff. I always say, when you invite me, be very careful in which direction the teaching goes. So oh my okay? God. No, no, and you have a great exposure with your channel. I love your channel. I know you have for lots of fun. I wish that Zenit people from Switzerland watch Federico Docs watches. Because one month from now, I'm going to be with you and let's be very careful in which direction the teaching goes. Okay? Guys, just so you know, he's cocky, but he's also the man. I've seen Hansi do some kidding. things. Dude, I've seen you do some things. No, but, uh, but like more than watchmaking. With, my, my uncle's watch, right? Right. My uncle jumped to the swimming pool with a classic GMT master. I mean, this thing's expensive. Mm -hmm. And we ruined the hands. He ruined the hands. Yes. You made them look brand new again. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The thing is, no, I'm not finished with silicone. Oh, please. I'm totally not finished with please. silicone. Kill silicone. The thing is, I developed a procedure for, in my workshop, when I have Zenit mm -hmm. El Primero with silicone parts, where I can completely service a watch where the freaking those two parts will not wear itself to pieces. Zenit does not accept my solution to their problems. That's the amazing thing. <laughs> That's, That's awful. absolutely amazing. And they should be no hell for that. Don't break I'm that. telling you. Are no. we cutting that out? I'm not no, that do out. not cut that out. Okay, I insist okay. you do not cut that out. Because I I'm a master watcher. I can develop. I, I develop procedures constantly in my workshop, you know. Mm -hmm. And and they, they're so annoying when it comes to those things because an outsider will save our problem. You understand? Well, but the Swiss it's are just slow. They're so slow yes. with everything. So yeah. I developed that procedure, which is uh, I told you because I wanted to have I went twenty one. But don't tell, don't tell them because it's no, trade I mean, secrets. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I'm gonna the teaching gonna go one way or the other. We gotta see in a month from now. <laughs> so you wanted the five twenty one guys. That's right. a beautiful skeleton. You have one in, in your in stock. It's sold. <laughs> Sorry. I want it. Okay. Employee discount. Next time. Okay. <laughs> no, what I usually do is uh, if if if. If it's for, in my possession, I immediately change the silicone parts. So you mean if, if, it's, if it's your watch? If it would be mine, I would throw away the silicone parts and put the, the standard parts in it. Because but, but, but they it, hold forever. It does have an anti-magnetic property. That is yeah, true. Yeah, but, but nobody has a problem. I need There's some people who have anti-magnetic machines and they always press the button. I don't know who those people are. <laughs> yeah, guys, if you have a magnetizer at home, <laughs> don't use it. Please be careful. Because, I mean, I have one in the office, you know, I, Hansi works, uh, he, he's, not tw he's not eight hours a day with me, right? Because you, you have other clients yes. and, and, and all of that. Um, but sometimes I, you know, I get a watch in and it's a little fast and I demagnetize it. I didn't know that that demagnetizer can actually be quite dangerous. Yes, you actually magnetize the whole case. And then to demagnetize the case is very difficult. Yeah, so guys... Don't just go on Amazon and, and, no. and buy one, you know. It's not worth it. I mean, I know a lot of you guys have it already. Just, if you already have one, just press it lightly. No, but I recommend for people who have one, mm. buy, buy a two or three dollar compass. Put it the compass around the watch. If the needle swings, you can, you're allowed to demagnet that. You're allowed. If not, you're but not if allowed. But if the needle doesn't go close to the watch and it doesn't de deviate from north, then don't put it on that machine. Got it. Uh, guys, I have Hans. You know, he's, uh, he's, his workload is a little bit uh, lighter now, so we're doing some videos and enjoying ourselves. What do you want to know? What do yeah. you want to see? Right? Yeah. Do, you, do you want more interviews and questions? Right. Do you want to see some detailed, um, like, watchmaking work? That might be fun to, to show certain things. Yeah. You know, like... Um, like maybe, uh, I don't know, poison. We, we, that would be really a cool thing to, to teach. Yeah. Not to teach necessarily because nobody can do it really themselves. But to just to see the process, how it works, that's that's might be super interesting. It would be uh, I would be very passionate about that actually. Well, let's that's do cool. it, guys. Thank you so much for sticking around. Please leave your comments. Please show Hansi a little bit of love, <laughs> um, because I know you don't love the camera, but no, that's why I, for a month, seven, six months, I didn't show up here. Yeah, but you love me, and you know it's good for the channel. So. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, please don't forget to like and subscribe and check out DelrayWatch.com if you need to buy a watch or of course if you need the service. You've got a great resource here um, and you know what, Hansi, your Rolex services are still half the price of something into a Rolex. Right? Oh, you're kidding? Yeah, of course. So it's also priced very well. So please check out DelrayWatch.com. Super. Anyway guys, thank you so much and we'll catch you 
in the next one. Take care.